Yep. Hello. Good morning, church. Uh, good morning. Good to see you again. Good to see you, Margaret and Randall there, and Maria and Barbie there, and Tito Adrian and Tita Delma and uh, Marcelo. Oh, Marcelo family is here. And Dina. Hello. Good morning. So let us gather in the presence of the Lord. Uh, let us all stand up. And yes, um, you know, it's always good to start with the scripture before we, uh, we sing song of praises. Uh, yes, uh, let us all stand up, guys, and <laughs> let us prepare to worship the Lord. But before we sing the first song, do you know that um, that gathering in the presence of the Lord, uh, it brings us uh, to increase our faith? It says in Romans uh, 10.17, who knows that Roman 10.17? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So you see, we're going to hear the word of the Lord, so consequently it will increase our faith. Amen? So let us sing to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. Let us prepare our hearts. Just say thank you, Father. Oh, we give thanks to you. You know it's good to give thanks to the Lord for all He has done and continue doing in our lives. It brings good health as well. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. the last time forever 
Father God. Amen. You know, it's nice to be in the presence of the Lord. So, yeah, just uh, wave to uh, the people uh, near to you. And, yeah. Hallelujah. Good morning. <laughs> okay, so we're going now to the... Uh, to the offering and let us pray for that one. Uh, uh, may I invite Brother Don to just uh, say a little prayer for the offering. Amen. Uh, Lord, uh, thank you, Lord God, uh, for this day. Yes. Thank you, Lord, uh, for everything, for all the blessing that you have done. Thank you, thank you, Lord, for guiding us always. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. So, stewards, uh, please uh, collect the. Uh, Offering and let us sing the um, yeah strength will rise. Hallelujah. <laughs> As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever, our hope, our strong again and for our communion we go now may I call on brother Adrian you may be seated
emblems now. Our uh, scripture readings to John chapter 9, verse 1 to 7. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eye. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sand. So the man went and washed and came home, saying. According to this passage, as Jesus walking, he saw a man born blind. He was blind from his birth. And this is a question where the disciples cannot determine whether is it his sin or his parents' sin? The disciples believe that sickness and suffering are the result of sin. This belief of the disciples is the same most of the Jews. They saw illness as a punishment for not following the commandments. When they see a sick person, it was believed that some sin has been committed that this is the cause of that person's suffering. So the disciples asked Jesus, which of their two questions is the correct explanation? Was it his own or his parents sin the cause of his blindness? So what should be your reaction if someone says you are suffering because you have committed a sin? And now God was punishing you. What will be your reaction if someone tells you that your child suffers because you have committed a sin. It is true that there are children born blind or born without hands, but there are illness and suffering that we do not trace where they come from. If a person is suffering, we don't know behind the suffering why did this happen to him. Only God knows. So what is the Lord's view of the blind man? In verse 3, Jesus tells us that the actual condition of this man was not a result of his own or his parents' sin. But he is blind so that the power of God may be seen of him. Jesus did not explain the cause of this man's blindness, but the purpose he sees in the blind man is an opportunity to display the works of God so that Jesus might have an opportunity of working a miracle in the cure of him. He's going to free this blind man from the bondage of darkness. And in verse 5, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Jesus always backed up his claims with application. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Then Jesus decided to complete the healing process by having the man take action himself, prescribing that man should go wash in the pool of Siloam. The blind man did exactly as Jesus instructed, and as he washes his eyes, his physical sight healed. In this event, the blind man became a spiritual object of Jesus Christ. He stands as a picture of a condition of all men. He was suffered blind from his birth. He had never seen the light of the sun. He had never experienced the beauties of the surroundings. He lived his entire life in darkness until Jesus delivered him from the bondage of darkness. 
it's true we have never suffered from physical blindness, but we are all born blind and need our eyes to be opened by Jesus. In the scripture, Paul describes Satan as the cause of spiritual blindness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the mind of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So we have never suffered from physical blindness, but there was a day when we are all blinded by the devil to the things of God until Jesus healed us and delivered us from the bondage of darkness. Amen. And this deliverance have been made possible only through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. As the sun is the natural light of the world, Jesus is the light of the spiritual world and light of all people with illness and disabilities. Amen? So let's all stand as we partake together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your great love and mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your incredible sacrifice so that we might have freedom and life. Thank you, Lord, that you open our eyes to see the gifts you have given us in our life. We love you and we need you every day. We give you praise for you alone are worthy. Now let's partake together. Yes, Lord, we come into your presence. We just give thanks to you, Lord, for what you've done on the cross. Thank you, Father God, for opening our eyes to see your glory, Lord. Glory of the Father through the Son. Every day. Every day. 
every day I just again to love you. To keep your words in my heart. Give it all to you now, Lord, I will surrender.
Give your best love to the Lord. Hallelujah. Christine's had a bit of surgery this past week and she's doing well going home today. So we need to uphold her in prayer and and uh, see her restored um, and uh, as I said to you um, a couple of weeks ago actually prior to Christmas I think it was a Christmas Eve um, Sheikh Zabir his, um, her, his daughter uh, Sheikh Zabir and Fatima their daughter is still in and out of hospital she's in she's 
We've got a battle going on, and he's asked for prayer from us. So we can uphold Afruza and uh, Pastor Christine. And as we pray, if there's others in your world you know that need healing, or if maybe you're here, does someone need prayer today for healing? Yeah. We're going to you know, reach out and really grab hold of what we pray and, and let, it, let it come and come to you. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, it's a, a privilege to be able to come around the table. It's a privilege to stand in your presence and worship. We know, Father, that your heart is for us and, and, and Lord, that you have made provision for, for our well-being. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, we bring our, our friends to you, Pastor Christine, in this uh, surgery. Lord, let her healing be, uh, be rapid, Lord. Let it be solid. Let, it be, let her find wellness, Lord, in you, body, soul, and spirit, Lord. As she returns home today, Father, let her rest and recuperation be filled with your peace and your presence, I pray in Jesus' name. And, Lord, we bring a fruza to you, Lord. We uphold her in the name of Jesus, Lord that you would visit her, that you would, you, would, you would touch her body, Lord God, touch her mind, Father, that she would be completely healed in the name of Jesus. Lord, whatever it is that is this, the source of this illness, that Lord God, by your merciful and loving hand, reach and touch her in the name of Jesus and set her free in Jesus' name. For Noel, Lord, and for others in this congregation, Lord, others that are, are sick today, Lord, I pray, Lord, Raise them up, Lord. Strengthen body, soul, and spirit in the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord God, we press through as we press into you, Lord God, that uh, healing power comes and we give you thanks. Father, as we open the word today, I pray you'll, you'll speak to us as individuals, as a group, as a church. But you'll speak to us, oh God. That, Father, our lives will be transformed, that we step closer to you. We worship you, Lord, that we would love you. And Father, let your Holy Spirit guide us and speak to us, Lord, in Jesus' glorious name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Hey, fantastic. Have a seat. Thanks, team. <coughs> Welcome to our 9.30 service, our, our uh, long weekend service. And... Uh, it's good to have you with us, and if you've been on leave, holidays, I pray it was a good, good break for you, and you, you've come back rested, um, ready for another year. I just got a text message from my son on my watch saying that uh, there's an announcement at 11 o'clock today by the Prime Minister. Keep an eye on emails, that's my point. Keep an eye on emails. We don't know what it's going to look like next week, but uh, we'll adapt. We'll adapt, and... Uh, uh, our intention, of course, is to give uh, as much opportunity for people to be together as we can, as we can, and that's our intention. So it seems that, um, again, you know, we have our scanning and the washing and the, the sanitising and so on. Be wise, be wise in, uh, in, in what you're doing. This Omicron thing seems pretty nasty, but be believing, but be wise as well as to uh, how you decide to, to manage um, this next thing that seems to be hitting our country or around the world as well. But don't let fear be your guide. Let Jesus be our guide through all this. Amen? Good. Today, I want to talk about the presence of God. This is a, a, a very um, uh, important subject and very close to my heart as to the, the experience of his presence and, and that, uh, again, Christianity is not just meant to be a, an ideology or a philosophy uh, or even just a, a, um, a set of rules and regulations. It's meant to be something, an experiential um, um, religion, if you like, a faith. And I want to read, we're going to read a little bit of scripture today in the time we have, which is not a lot of time, but we're going to read a bit of scripture and we'll see how far we get today. But Titus chapter 2, if you've got a Bible or on your phone or whatever, I'm going to read it from the, the Passion, but uh, uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Let's have a, a read here. It says this, God's marvellous grace has manifested in person, bringing salvation for everyone. This same grace teaches us how to live each day as we turn our backs on ungodliness and indulgent lifestyles, and it equips us to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age. For we continue to wait for the fulfilment of our hope in the dawning splendour of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus, the Anointed One, the Messiah. 
He sacrificed himself for us that he might purchase our freedom from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people who are his very own, passionate to do what is beautiful in his eyes. Paul says to Titus, so preach these truths and exhort others to follow them. Be willing to expose sin in order to bring correction with full authority without being intimidated by anyone. The issue of intimidation is a big subject today. If you disagree with people, they intimidate you. Don't allow them to intimidate you. But what a great passage. It speaks of the grace of God has manifested in person, has appeared in person. And of course, it's referring to Jesus Christ. The grace of God demonstrated is not just a theological concept, it's a person of, 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 that has manifested, has come, the Son of God, God incarnate in the flesh. God has not just spoken it in words, but he's actually declared it through the person of Christ. And it's interesting when we read um, a little bit of the Old Testament, we're going to look at um, uh, Moses and, and an encounter with God that I really believe is very relevant to today and describes um, if you like, uh, uh, this encounter that can, can really, I suppose, describe what it can be for us today. And even way back in Exodus 33, which is where we're going to go back to right now and, uh, and have a read of this passage. Moses uh, is regarded as a prophet um, and is one of the great prophets, if you like, in, in the Old Testament. And uh, he was... He knew God, he knew the presence of God, but he also knew the value of the presence of God and the importance of the presence of God. Many, many Christians, um, I, I believe, uh, live in their brain, live in their mind only and are scared to, to move into the place to actually experience God, even to ask the question, Lord, Lord ha, ha, can I know you intimately? Can I know you as a, as a friend? We sing the songs... But it's how we live is often very different to, to that. It's easy to say, I'm a friend of God, but what does that mean? A friend is someone you hang out with, true? Someone, if you declare them a friend, it's they, you, you spend time with them. So we're going to read, um, actually we're going to read the whole chapter 33 of uh, Exodus. So if you've got a Bible, I'm reading um, from the uh, CSB. It says this, The Lord spoke to Moses, Go up from here. You and the people you brought up from the land of Egypt to the land of, of, of I promised to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, saying, I'll give it to your offspring. I will send an angel ahead of you and I'll drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hethites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites and Vegemites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up with you because you are a stiff-necked people. Otherwise, I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard this bad news, they mourned and didn't put on their jewellery. It's, it's an interesting moment there. Um, have you ever thought, like, when you read some of those things, those lines, you think, "What? What? Why would you not put on your jewelry? Like, what? We get our, dressed up for Sunday and put on our best jewelry and whatever." But this was a moment of mourning, and and they recognised what God was saying that that because of their sinfulness, because of His glory and His majesty, that they couldn't dwell in the same place. That if, if he went with them, his, his very presence, they would die because of, the, of the, uh, his, his glory and his holiness. And so they didn't put on their jewellery. It really speaks of that, that almost repentant mourning, that, that honouring God and, and recognising this is, this is a serious moment. And it wasn't about, you know, me and how good I looked. It was about God. Go on, verse 5. It says, For the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that they need a chiropractor or a physio. It means they're stubborn. Now, not that there's anyone in our room here that's stubborn, but, you know, those people outside, you know what I mean? So outside the church, not, not you, or, you or me. Or, we're not like that, are we? <coughs> anyway, <laughs> if I went up with you for a single moment, I would destroy you. Now take off your jewellery and I would decide what to do with you. So the Israelites remained stripped of their jewellery from Mount Horeb onward. So this wasn't about their glory. This was about a moment of decision where God was going to decide what he was going to do. It was an incredible turning point in the, in the history of Israel. It, 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 the, this was a, such a serious moment because God has already declared, I can't go up with you because of, of, of this, of your sin, etc. Verse 7, Now Moses took a tent and pitched it outside the camp at a distance from the camp. You've read the book of Hebrews? You'll hear this in the book of Hebrews where Jesus was crucified outside the, the city is a reference very much to this, this also 
um, th this concept here. He called it the tent of meeting. Anyone who wanted to consult the Lord would go to the tent of meeting that was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would stand up, each one at the door of his tent, and they would watch Moses until he entered the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and remain at the entrance to the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. As all the people saw the pillar of cloud remaining at the entrance to the tent, they would stand up, then bow in worship, each one at the door of his tent. There's such a, a statement, there's so much in this passage, so much, that when Moses entered the very presence of God, everyone recognised the, the, the holy moment of that. And they would stand in their, the doorway of their home, their tent, and worship the Lord. What a great picture for us today as believers. To actually stand in the doorway of our homes and worship the Lord. Not, not physically, necessarily, but to actually recognise that when the presence of God is there, that we need to worship God and that we, we stand in the doorway of our homes. That we, we stand in that place where, where worship is part of, of our home. Verse 11, the Lord would speak with Moses face to face, just as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp. His assistant, the young man Joshua, son of Nun, would not leave the inside of the tent. So here's the, this is the picture. All right? There's a tent, and it's not like a two-man tent. This would be a large, large tent. And Moses would, would go into the, uh, the tent, into the very presence of God, and the cloud would come, and it would, it would stand at the door of the tent. It would and he would have this conversation with God. He, he wasn't seeing um, the face of God because the Bible says that that's not possible. But he'd speak to him face to face. In fact, the Hebrew, I think, says is mouth to mouth. He spoke to him like a friend, heart to heart, face to face, as you do, honestly, um, before him. But in all of this picture, there was a young man in there, Joshua, the son of Nun, doesn't mean he didn't have parents. It's N-U-N. He said would not leave the inside of the tent. So everything that happened between Moses and the Lord in the very presence of God, here is a young man who was really being discipled by Moses here, yeah, but by the Lord as well, to lead the, the nation later at the death of Moses. But it's interesting where this young man positioned himself inside the tent, in the presence of God. So Moses and even Joshua knew the very value of the presence of God. I think in our world, in our Western world, we've actually, I believe, we've actually lost the importance of coming into his presence. That we have, and, and you know, I'm not critical of Bible studies, but we have lots of Bible studies where the word is open, etc. But how many times do we actually stop to come into his presence? To sit before him quietly, to listen to the Holy Spirit speaking. And here's a young man, the next generation, positioned in the same tent. So God knew he was there, of course, and, and when the, the cloud would come down, here is a young man. My question is where we need this, the generations to be sitting in the very presence of God, in the very presence of other leaders as well. Like Moses, we need the Joshuas in our generation to be sitting in the presence of God, watching and learning as other Moseses, if I can use that word, um, as they converse and engage with the, the very presence of God. This is a, a great picture that is very contrary to our, again, our Western thinking, which is all very Greek, Hellenistic. It's about getting the facts right, rather than actually we need to learn the Scripture, we need to memorise the Scripture, we need to do all of that. But there's more to it than, than that. And I'm not taking away from the Scripture. Incredible. It's so important. But there is the very presence of God. Because the Bible says that the grace of God has come and manifested to us. There's a promise in John 14 that you can't miss. Well, you can if you, if you want to. It says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while and the world will see me no more. He was about to be crucified. But you will see me because I live, you also will live. Great promise. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is 
This is not just about a revelation. This is about an experience of God. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. This is, this is the picture of the Christian experience, that it's not, it's not just rules and regs on a page. They are, the Word of God is so important, incredibly important. But as we look at the Word of God, it draws us into a relationship with God that is, is far more personal. When I say personal, it's not just me as an individual, personal as us as a community. That's why we come together as a church. When we come around the communion table, we worship the Lord. We look for the operation of spiritual gifts. Gifts. We open the Scripture, expecting the Spirit of God to be speaking to us. It's in that environment. That's why prayer is important. It's like Joshua, the son of Nun, is sitting in the presence of God, watching and listening what's going on. So everything he heard later would set him uh, in, instead for, to lead Israel. Moses said to the Lord, Look, you have told me, lead this people up, but you have not let me know whom you'll send with me. See, see Moses is, understands um, more about the working of God than most people, I think, really give him credit for. Because he's saying this, he says, but who, who do you want to send with me? Not who do I think I should go with me? Because I think as we look at the Scriptures, and particularly the Old Testament, you know, look at Gideon. God says, you've got too many soldiers. Excuse me? Too many? How can you have too many soldiers? No, no, no. God says, you see... There's a saying by Reinhard Bonnke that says, we are meant to be power-assisted. We're meant to be people who it's not just based on our own ability, but it's on the demonstration of the power of God. And in fact, our faith is meant to be built on the very power of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 2, 5, I think it is, says that. And so here is a, here's a, another example. Moses knew God. He understood that, that it was about the Lord's glory, not his glory. And he says... Who do you want to go with me? When was the last time we asked that question? Or do we do the, the Lord, I've got this plan, bless it please? What if God says no? I mentioned that last week. He says, lead this people, but who, you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You said, I know you by name and you have also found favour with me. So that's good. That's a great recommendation. Now if I indeed found favour with you, please teach me your ways and I will know you. So even Moses, in the very presence of God, recognised that he needed to be taught by God the ways of God. Hands up anyone who thinks that applies today. There's four of us. <laughs> but it's true, to learn the ways of God. That's why the Scripture is so important. It teaches us His ways. Jesus says, you know, if you love me, you'll do what I commanded and we'll come and make a home with you. I will manifest myself to you. Have you asked the questions, what are the commands of Jesus? Love your neighbour as yourself, do good. I began a, a, last week on some of these, on the, the very core values. You know, be kind, loving, merciful, humble, you know, all of those things. Teach me your ways. David understood that as well, right through the Psalms. Teach me your way, O oh God. This, this, has a, a, this smells of humility it smells of someone who knows what repentance truly is. Repentance is actually turning to God. It's a continual turning to God. And he says, you know what? I mean, he could have written a book, Being in the Presence of God, video series, get on the, on the uh, conference circuit, you know? But what is his view is, Lord, I need to know your ways. God says, my ways are not your ways. My ways are higher than your ways. And so Moses recognises that. Could it be that maybe the frustrations that we're experiencing in our lives are a result of us not, in, not even looking for the ways of God? And I think that's true. In my own life, I, I mean, as I prepare this, it's, it's, it's a challenge to me. It's a huge challenge to all of us. A challenge to the greater church to recognise that we need to know God's ways, not just man's best ideas. It says, now if I indeed found favour with you, please teach me your ways and I will know you so that I might find favour with you. Now consider that this nation is your people. Great declaration. 
And, and he replied, God, the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. How cool is that? Hebrews. If you look at the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, it talks about the rest of God, but finding rest. And rest is not just necessarily the circumstances, rest is something that is internal. See, the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is really clear, the Old Covenant, New Covenant. The, new, the Old Covenant was an external to an internal. You obey, by the, obey the rules, etc. The New Testament is, no, it's from the inside out. The transformation of the human heart. But there, is, there has to be a willingness of the human to open their heart to the Lord, to say, Lord, teach me your ways. As, as we face difficulty, as we face life, you know, even forgetting our times, if, if COVID didn't exist, the challenges of daily life. Teach me your ways. How, what's my, what would be my response? And, and I look at the response and I say, Lord, that's a battle for me. That's hard for me. But this is about inside out, not outside in. This is not about, you know, you do this and God will love you. No, God loves you and he wants to transform us from the inside out. And I love that. I, I, that's where some other religions get it so, they make it so hard to even get close to God. And Jesus came as the Son of God himself, incarnate God, and said, not only will I be, will the Holy Spirit be with you, but he'll be in you, and there's an empowerment. Moses, now this is an incredible statement, he says this, if your presence does not go, Moses responded to him, don't make us go up from here. What an amazing statement. He said, if you're not going, I'm not going. The, we, we, often in our lives, what happens is we say, Lord, bless it, we run ahead, nothing happens, we get we, all sorts of issues, and we turn on God and say, where were you? He said, I was never in it in the first place. Yeah, but that's not fair, you know, it's because I'm the fourth member of the Trinity, you should do what I want. Well, no, that's not how it works. Moses understood it, and we need to learn from this, that in learning God's ways means not necessarily doing it our way but listening to what God is saying here in this place. He says, if your presence does not go, Moses responded to him, don't make us go out from here. He knew. I don't think Moses really knew what he was facing other than, you know, when you've got all the, the, the kites, the Amalekites and the Hivites, the Perizzites, Jebusites, etc., and the Marmites, they're in there too. Um, they were the New Zealand, <laughs> with the Australians and the Vegemites, so, yeah. But he, he was about to enter battle after battle after battle. He was get, there was going to be opposition, spiritual opposition is going to come against him. And, but Moses knew God well enough to say, if you don't go, I'm not going with you. I'm not going. Because it's, it's not my battle and I can't win the battle. Go back to the New Testament, Ephesians. You know, spiritual warfare. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. 2 Corinthians. They're not carnal. They're not physical weapons. The spiritual weapons, they're mighty to the pulling down of spiritual strongholds. The weapons that can transform the thinking of people and communities. Teach me your ways. And I believe that to go forward in, this, in the years to come, the church is going to be challenged and is being challenged and I'm being challenged to actually return to the area of the spiritual weaponry that God has given us. To actually say, Lord, if you're not in it, I'm not going. I don't care what people say. If you're not in it, we're not doing it. If you're in it, yeah, let's go for it. Moses understood this. How will it be known that I and your people have found favour with you unless you go with us? I and your people will be distinguished by this from all the other people on the face of the earth. In other words, they would be recognised, they would recognise, the nations around would recognise that God is, that he is the ever-living and that he is with these people. Isn't that the picture of the church? Rather than bowing down to, to pop culture and, 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 and opinions in the world, we should stand knowing the ways of God. We should stand knowing the power of God. We should stand apart from that and say, you know what? This is the place where you'll find freedom. This is the place where God dwells. He dwells in us, in his people. And this is not just about this place, but the church greater. 
Scripture time and time again. Let me read you one in, in Philippians chapter 1 that demonstrates this. Verse 27 says this in Philippians 1, Paul writing to the church, just one thing, as citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ, then whether I come and see you or in absent, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. Verse 28, not being frightened in any way by your opponents, this is a sign of distraction for them, but of your salvation, and this is from God. For it has been granted for you in Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had and now uh, here that I have now. He's saying, as you stand in the very power of God, in the knowledge, knowing his ways, and those that will try and intimidate the church, it'll be against them a witness of their destruction because they will not be able to intimidate the church. The church needs to stand up and not be intimidated. It's time. And Moses knew that. But he wasn't going to do it his own, of his own energy. It was about what God wanted to do. And he was going to wait until God moved and he moved. In fact, that's the picture of Israel, isn't it, in the desert? It, it's it's the, the Hebrews in the desert. They, they were told, when the cloud moves, you move. But when the cloud doesn't move, don't move. Maybe it would be easier if we had a cloud. Wouldn't it be easier? Follow the cloud, it goes, we go. But the same thing is for us as the church. Again, the Word of God is clear on some things, they're very clear on some things that we need to move in, we need to operate in, we need to be believing for, we need to be active in and not get caught up in side issues which are of, of little value to the Kingdom of God and actually little value to other people as well. Moses said, if you don't go, I'm not going with you. Well, I'm not going. You go, I'll go with you. The presence and power of God. And it's a preparation for people. And I believe today, more than ever, we need to be prepared. And it starts in the very presence of God. Both here in, in the church community, but also in your private life as well. I, as JV knows, I love cricket. All right, it's cricket season. And I pray a lot for the Australian team. No, that's not. <laughs> That's right, yeah, exactly, yeah. But it's easy to be distracted by stuff, isn't it? You know, I've got sport channels on and Big, Bang, Big Bash on late at night and whatever, and I can easily get persuaded to sit and watch cricket. But I know they'll play it in heaven, and Australia will hold the ashes forever in heaven. Won't they, JV? Yes, yeah, thank you, JV. The Indian team will improve and they'll be all right there too. So, so. <laughs> but it's so easy to be distracted and move away from what's really valuable. And, and I know that in my whole new reality of time that I have now, you know, my nights, etc., have been redefined for me. No, Julie, it's very, very different. And so what I've found is that, that the draw to actually spend more time with the Lord and more time in, in the Scriptures and just waiting on the Lord. And it's, but it's a real challenge. Because there's cricket happening in the, in, you know. It might not be cricket for you, but you know what I'm talking about, don't you? To find the presence of God. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, it says, you know, come to the throne of grace boldly, so that in times of need, you'll be familiar with the, the, the place of grace. Most of us don't do it. We're the other way. We come to the, grace, the throne of grace rapidly, nervously, fearfully, in the midst of, of need, and he's saying, no, no, Moses, be like Moses. You don't go, I'm not going. But let's build the, the tent, if you like, of meeting. The Lord, the Lord's answered to Moses, verse 17, I will do this very thing you have asked, for you have found favour with me, and I know you by name. Oh, isn't that amazing? God knows your name. You're not just number whatever. He knows your name. Then Moses said, please let me see your glory. He said, God, the Lord said, he, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I'll proclaim the name, the Lord, before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But he added, you cannot see my face for humans cannot see me and live. The Lord said, here is a place near me. You are to stand on the rock and when my glory passes by, 
I will put you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you will see my back, but my face will not be seen. I love Moses. In all of this, his heart was to see God. What an amazing place. And God wasn't upset by that. He wasn't, how dare you ask? He said, you know what? I'm going to make provision so that you can see God. That is a New Testament I- image. And that's why it's like this, the whole basis of repentance, of turning to God. We're asking by turning to God and saying, Lord, I want to see your glory. I want to see your face. I want to know you. I just don't want to know about you. I want to know you. See, as a, a friend to friend, you know each other. You know their likes, your dislikes, your quirks the funny things, the weird things, don't you? If you're a married couple, you could write a book but probably have to leave the country about your partner. But you know them and that's what we're talking about here. But I love Moses. He says, show me your glory. Let me see your glory. And so God makes a provision for him as he has for us to be able to be free of sin and death and through the cross, of what Jesus has done. He's made that provision that we can actually, we will see God one day. We will see, we'll be in his presence one day. That sin, that that barrier has been broken down. And I think... I suppose as I've prepared this message, it's been a real challenge for for me personally as well. It's to actually refocus on what God wants for us. The grace of God has come. And there's so much written. That was the book of Titus. Homework this week is have a look at the book of Titus. Have a read. See what it says. What the expectation of God is because the grace of God has come. Tragically, often many of us take the grace of God for, for granted rather than stop and realise that it's God's mercy that, is, that is, is, is granted us and his kindness. Because one day there will be judgment and we can't avoid that. There will be judgment and, and we'll have to stand and other people will stand before the, 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 the Lord and have to give an account of every word and every deed. And in, it, really I want to finish with this scripture. In Exodus 34, verse 6, says this, The Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed. It wasn't just like, here's my back, but this is what he has proclaimed way back in Exodus. The Lord, the Lord is compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion and sin. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the father's iniquity on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. This is a serious statement. It's very Hebraic. It's a very um, um, you know, um, uh, statement that a Hebrew would really understand that. But it's interesting that the, the, he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the father's iniquity on the children for th- third and fourth, but the, unfaithful, sorry, the faithful love and truth to a thousand generations. And the, the, the thousand in the scripture really is a representative of endless, unlimited. That his love and mercy, those that would embrace him, that would follow the ways of God, repent and turn to God. Now Christ has made it possible that sin and death has been dealt with and we can enter into that presence of God. My question to all of us and me included, why aren't we entering? Why aren't we entering? And it's not just so we can experience weird stuff, it's that we can actually experience the true living God. And Jesus went to all that trouble to lay down his life, to die and be raised from the dead, to open heaven for us and for any human being that will come repentant, turning to God and recognising what Christ has done and believing on him. And that's the message for today. I pray that 2022 and beyond will be filled with his presence. If you're finding that your Christian faith is stale, Get into the presence of God. Sit quietly before him. Shh, be still and know that I am God. To silence our heart before him. Stop making accusations or demands and say, Lord, 
I want to know your ways. Live in the scriptures. I love the Psalms for that reason. They teach so much about what it is to worship and to live in his presence. And if you're not a believer, it starts by recognising that what Jesus has achieved is for you and that you need a saviour and that you can't be your own saviour. It is not possible. But if you will repent, you'll turn to, to, to God through Christ, accepting what he's done on the cross, salvation comes your way. Some people think it's about saying a prayer. Yeah, you need to pray, you need to confess, of course it is. But it's more to it than that. It's the bowing of our heart, the worship, as we had the, the picture of the people in the tents. When Moses went into the presence of God, what did they do? They bowed before the Lord and they bowed their hearts in acknowledging that God is the Lord. And that's the picture of what repentance is, of humility, of humbling ourselves, recognise he is the only way to God. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for Moses. Thank you for just your goodness and your graciousness, Lord, your loving kindness to all of us. And Father, I pray, pray for all of us. Lord, right now, in people's minds, there are some people even here, it's almost I can almost hear it, just battling with the issue of, of secret sin, of, of attitudes and things that you're, you're dealing with. And I thank you for that. So Father, I pray you'll lift us out of all of that as we look to Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. And we look to you, our Father, that we would know your presence. Fill our homes, fill our hearts, fill our church with your presence, I pray. And Father, if there's someone in this place that doesn't know you, truly doesn't know you, Holy Spirit, will you touch their heart even now? Will you draw them to yourself? Will you reveal yourself to them that they could be saved? In Jesus' glorious name. Everyone said? Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. Anyone wants any prayer? Come. More than happy to, to pray.